Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Gabriel Santos. These are my team members, Carolina Casaniga and Eric Fernandez. Uh, we're here today to present to your senior design bike, an educational robotic kit for high school students. Uh, briefly, before we begin, I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Justin Oglo, our advisor, uh, Mr. Sigarelli, who helped us for the manufacturing section of the project, and of course, to all of you for taking the time to be here. So, let's get started. Uh, what's the problem we're addressing? Well, there's a real uh, need for both professors and students to incorporate more robotic courses at the high school level in order to better prepare the students for uh, university programs in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Our motivation is driven by the thought of inspiring young students to pursue a career in STEM, as well as to help them interact with real robotics at a low cost, making an affordable option for high schools with lower budgets. So real quick, the very first thing we did was do some research about the current similar products being offered in the market right now. So we came across several ones. Among the most popular, we have the Back Robotics, the Cano, the Lego Mindstorm, the Hummingbird Robot. These are all really great robotic kits with interesting features. However, they all struggle to find a balance between the price, the quality, and the complexity they offer. Another aspect of the research was done at the consumer level. Here we were able to realize that the three main uh, problems in STEM education at the high school level comes down to cost, having content up, up to date with the latest technologies, and having a dynamic to, uh, curriculum that engages the students' uh, interest. We lectured at two different schools. Uh, we wanted to get gather feedback from the schools. We went to our community academy in Miami Beach Senior High, and we talked to them about our robot. Uh, they were very interested. So after conducting our preliminary research, we decided to pinpoint what exactly were our objectives, which were to design a robotics kit that was challenging enough for students and also to be able to motivate them to go into STEM. We wanted to produce a low-cost kit, make a dynamic curriculum, and be able to test our prototype with uh, our engineering analysis and simulation that we would previously do. Here's our Gantt chart that helped us stay on track for this project. So for the final design of our robot, we went with the three-wheeled robot. We have the two front wheels powering the robot with a rear um, free rotating wheel. Um, we decided to go with two levels in order to keep the level compact. Um, if you actually see, the aluminum is perforated in order to give a little bit more flexibility for the students to be able to place the sensors in different components in whichever way they prefer. Um, and then we also wanted to basically make it as easy as possible to assemble so, that, um, so the students can be able to do this in the classroom environment. So as you can see here, we decided to go with a Romeo BLE microcontroller. Um, the two front wheels, like I said, are powered and then the rear wheel is a, a free rotating caster wheel. Um, we have two DC motors powering the wheels and then rechargeable batteries. Um, after doing a lot of research, we actually narrowed down to which components and sensors we wanted to do. Um, based on the things we wanted the students to learn. Um, so we have an infrared reflective sensor, infrared sensor, small buzzer, uh, sound sensor, LEDs, and then obviously all the component mounts and hardware and everything for the mounting. So part of uh, constructing this robot, we needed to conduct a battery analysis to decide exactly what battery would be best uh, for high school students. So after looking at all the different standard types of batteries, we decided to go with the nickel metal hydride batteries. Uh, because they were cheap and reliable, uh, we also conducted how long it would approximately take for the batteries, like how long they would last, and it would be approximately 4.75 hours. In continuation with that, the, we did motor analysis. We needed to look at three different factors. We needed to look to make sure that whatever motor we chose was compatible with our Romeo Blue Board. It needed to have sufficient power output and be low cost. So we also looked at the different forces that were involved with our robot. We needed to make sure that whatever motor we chose had a positive uh, net uh, force. And so after doing all that and looking at different motors, we decided to go with Servo Cities motor and wheels. We, in continuation with the motor analysis, we did some dynamic and vibration analysis. There was really no potential threat with vibration analysis if everything is secured on a robot, making sure that the motors were properly secure, all the other components were properly secured, so uh, there, there wasn't anything that would be detrimental. 
So if you can see here, we did an evaluation of our chassis using SOLIDWORKS. We modeled the entire um, chassis, and then we determined which were going to be the normal operating conditions for the robot, and then we used the maximum amount of possible, um, you know, both thermal loads, um, stress loads, and everything like that, in order to do like a worst case scenario on our robot. Um, just to find the factors of safety and determine whether the robot was safe for students to use in a classroom. Um, so if you can see for our thermal analysis, we actually found that um, sometimes the microcontrollers overheat a lot. Um, and we actually have, um, under the microcontroller, at first we had it right up against the metal, um, which kind of overheated it to around 303 degrees Kelvin. Um, so what we decided to do is place a microcontroller on some nylon standoffs to have a little bit um, less heat transfer between the microcontroller. For the stress analysis, we actually found our factor of safety to be around 3.74. Um, with maximum loads, um, which we deem safe enough. The flexion analysis, we actually found if we placed every component um, as, you know, like a load on one of the levels, um, instead of both of them spread out, we would actually only have a deflection of about 0.2 millimeters, um, which is, you know, pretty normal for metal. So for manufacturing, we actually got some quotes for some local um, and companies and some other companies across the U.S. As you can see, the milling is the most expensive because it would just be, you know, milling a piece out of nothing. Um, the stamping would actually be our lowest cost uh, with a higher cost up front. Um, so the stamping, we got a quote for a short run metal die, uh, which would only last us about 10,000 parts. Um, but it would stay relatively cheap with only $2.50, and that's a manufacturing cost of running the machine and everything that is included. Um, if we went with a long run metal die, which is a little bit more expensive, you know, north of $40,000, we'd be able to use that same die for millions of parts. So for the chassis construction, we actually used um, a pre-perforated aluminum sheet. Um, we marked it and then cut it um, here in the manufacturing center. Um, and then we started, um, we used a drill press in order to place the rear caster wheel on the bottom. And then we began the assembly process in order to maximize, you know, make it as easy as possible for the students. Um, so after some trial and error, we found the easiest assembly process. Um, you simply mount the motors, the front wheels, and the rear caster wheel. It only takes a few minutes. We mount the top plate to the bottom plate after adding the, the bottom wheels. And then you can mount the assorted microcontroller and different sensors and everything like that. So it's relatively straightforward for the process. Here you can see the final product. Um, you can see it physically right there as well. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to be talking a little bit about the testing and the debugging we did for all the components. Uh, well, first of all, all the programming and the code compiling was done using the Arduino Integrated Development Environment, or IDE for short. Uh, here's where we transfer the codes from our computer into the actual robot. Uh, here's a screenshot of what the user interface looks like. Uh, so the very first component we tested was the motors. Our microcontroller has a driver motor included that actually delivers two amps of current. So because we're drawing two DC motors simultaneously, each one gets one amp. As a side note, this was one of the main reasons why we decided to go with only a two-wheel power rover instead of a four, because that would have meant each motor would just get 0.5 amps, <coughs> significantly reducing the speed and the torque. Uh, so anyhow, we were able to create a full width modulation program, and which allows us to input values from negative 255 up to positive 255, this last one representing the maximal speed of the robot while zero means no movement at all. So taking that into account, we were able to make the robot move backwards and forwards at different speeds and also to rotate uh, to both directions. Uh, we also tested the LEDs. To do this, we created very simple and short programs that would light up the LEDs at different time intervals and intensities. We also debugged the five programmable buttons that included in the microcontroller. To do this, we created a reactive feedback program. So using the serial monitor, we were able to send OK messages every single time one of the buttons was pressed, signifying that there had been a successful communication between the computer and the microcontroller. Uh, we also tested the, the buzzers, so the speakers. We uploaded several music uh, programs that work by converting uh, musical notes into frequencies and then into their corresponding analog values so that the microcontroller could actually read them. Even just for fun, we were able to play like things such as you know the Star Wars theme song and funny things for students to play around with that. Uh, we also have a sound sensor. Uh, so once again, we use a reactive fever program for this one uh, to measure the loudness of the ambient. Here are the screenshot of our results. So higher values equate to higher decibel levels. Uh, then we move forward to testing our reflective sensor, which consists of eight emitters and receivers that measure the light reflecting from a 
flat surface. Uh, ultimately, this was done with the purpose of doing tests such as following a black light path or following like a flashlight in a dark room. Um, so after we conducted several experiments, uh, here's a screenshot of the results. Here, column number four stands for the sensor number four, and it reads a color grading value of zero, which means that the black line, when we were testing the robot on top of uh, the black line pad, uh, it's right underneath that sensor number four. Uh, then we moved on to test the sharp IR, which uh, basically emits a light beam of infrared light to measure distance through a process of triangulation. Now, unfortunately, the relationship between the values that are output from the sensor and the physical distance, it's not linear, thus we have to create like a simple calibration experiment. Uh, the setup was fairly straightforward, we just measured the physical distance from the sensor to a flat object, and then correlated those values to the analog values of the sensor. We grabbed that data, and uh, we plot it, and we created an exponential curve to find the uh, line of the equation. So using that newfound line equation, we were able to modify the source of, of the of the program, and therefore calibrating the sensor. Uh, here's a neural percentage versus distance graph, which actually tells us that the sensor becomes less and less accurate as, as the object moves further away from the, from the actual sensor, with a maximal distance of 80 centimeters. Uh, here's a good video, uh, if you can play them. It's just uh, the robot doing some obstacle avoidance task uh, using this sharp IR, so as you can see, every time it's kind of bump into an object, it just we have a program to go backwards and then just find a different path. So these are some of the activities that the students might be able to play around when they're dealing with the robot. Uh, lastly, we tested the Bluetooth debugging for this. Uh, we're actually able to control the robot using our cell phones via Bluetooth. So we'll be more than happy to show like a quick demonstration during the Q&A session. So you can see these are some of the surveys, um, some of the standards that we use. Um, so obviously this is for educational purposes, so we want to make this safer for students to be able to use in the classroom. Um, basically, these, these first two standards go over what teachers can do to make uh, you know, the classroom safe and the lab safe for the students to be able to use it, and what to do in case of emergencies, um, and also what to, like, how to keep the students safe and how the students can uh, prevent accidents and everything like that. The last one is the toy safety standards, which I actually put forward for Congress, and that one goes over actual um, safety of the, using different materials and testing methods in order to make sure that it's safe for students and young children. Um, so this is the most important part we think, um, which is the learning curriculum. You know, this robot would be nothing without the actual background that the students get, you know, learning all these principles. Uh, so we made four different modules for it. The first one goes into robotics and how the students can use robotics in everyday lives and make a career out of it. Um, the second one goes over computing and electric. Um, electricity, you know, like electric components and everything like that. The third one goes into programming, like we said, we use C++ in this, um, which is the Ar what Arduino uses, so it's a very simple language for the students to learn. And then the last one goes into actual engineering principles that we can test using this robot, uh, forces, vectors, and everything like that. So obviously we want to keep um, the environment as a deep concern. Um, it is a battery powered robot, so we have to make sure that you know the batteries are disposed of properly and everything like that. We decided to use rechargeable batteries because they're better for the environment um, in the long run instead of using those one use batteries. Um, we also, the electrical components, we have to you know dispose of them in certain ways. If something breaks or anything like that, you can't just throw them out, you have to properly dispose of it. Um, as far as safety and risk, you know, we are using electrical components, there's always risk for shock. Um, especially for students and everything like that that aren't trained to use these components. Um, at these current voltages, there's no real risk uh, for any serious harm, but we did write some guidelines down for the students to remain safe and you know, not be able to cause any harm. Uh, okay, so for economic analysis, we ended up with a raw cost without the batteries of around $173 and an average cost of uh, $205 with the charge of batteries included. We also added an extended uh, sensor package for additional $43, you know, with more sensors for the students to play around with and stuff. Uh, now, if we were to market this product and add, let's say, a 40% margin uh, profit, uh, we would still be $63 cheaper than the leading brand right now, uh, which is 18% uh, uh, less than the current brand. Uh, here's a, a quick graph uh, showing our hypothetical retail price versus the competition in terms of cost. So our robot 
it's definitely one of the most affordable options currently right now. So part of a social impact is to inspire students to be able to uh, learn STEM and be able to get into STEM and create a new generation of problem solvers. Also, since our curriculum is multilingual, we'll be able to collaborate with other countries and be able to work on similar projects or the same project and be able to teach them the same exact concepts. Part of uh, global awareness is to make sure that our curriculum, uh, we were able to create it in Spanish and English. We understand that not all schools are able to afford robotics courses, so our robotics kit is lower than the, mark, the market, uh, the leading market brand. We're aware that not all students are also at the same level of knowledge. Our curriculum is beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And our main language is C++, which is used in industries worldwide. And it's part of our uh, university curriculum to be able to learn C++. So that's a plus for the students to be able to learn that. In conclusion, we were able to uh, do every single one of our um, objectives. We were able to manufacture a pre pre robotics, uh, prepackaged robotics kit, make it modular, safe, and cost effective. We made an engaging curriculum, teaching uh, students uh, STEM principles, and we received very positive feedback from all the schools and students. As part of as us being uh, engineers soon, we have to keep pace with new technologies. Uh, the principles that we've learned in this project, we will continue to use it later on in our professional careers. Some of our future work is to create a better material for our chassis, uh, make sure that it's also pre-purchased uh, and pre-manufactured, collect more feedback from schools, and also continue working uh, with schools and expand our curriculum. Thank you so much, and uh, if, you, if you have any questions, please let us know. Have you guys produced the manual for this? Or? Yes, it's it's included in our report. Um, we have a full assembly manual and with the curriculum and everything like that. Also, have you guys looked into other means of manufacturing? I saw that the stamping was a little bit expensive and the molding, like laser cutting and water jet cutting. Yeah, I mean, if you see, we have some very basic manufacturing. Um, we t try talking to other companies and everything like that, but as you know, we're students and they kind of put us on the back burner. Um, so a lot of these companies, you know, wouldn't give us direct quotes and everything like that. Like for that long run, um, stamping is not a direct quote because they couldn't actually sit there and give us a direct quote on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we did look into other options. It just wasn't, you know, didn't, some of these companies didn't want uh, to. To add to that, um, Another alternative would be after uh, we talked to Mr. Segrelli about different options for the manufacturing process. And nowadays you can find really cheap pre-manufactured uh, plates already done for you. So taking into, into consideration the amount of time it took us and, and effort, which wasn't that bad, but not all high schools will have like a shop or the correct machinery to do what we did. So maybe just looking into buying some pre-manufactured uh, plates that are already, you know, they're like one or two dollars cheap uh, in price could be a better option to put in the robotic kit instead of having them to cut themselves the actual sheet and then just having them manufactured. So that could be another different alternative to it. As far as the uh, directional uh, control on the, uh, on the robot, was there any uh, observation or comparison between doing uh, just a single drive in the back and making the front caster directional versus the setup that you have today. Did you ever consider that? Like you're saying power the rear caster wheel? Yeah, just you you have dual control, right? On yeah. both rears. So that's what giving what's giving you your directional uh, component. Uh, what about having just one motor drive both wheels but have your front caster actually directional? Did you actually oh, consider okay. that? Like including some sort of servo yeah. in, the, in the front wheel. Uh, we do have a, the option to include a servo with the microcontroller we're currently using. Uh, we didn't look into the option of actually testing the servo for the caster wheel. If we were to use it in the future, uh, our actual approach would be to use the servo to uh, mount the, the IR sensor. That way, to get a better perspective for the steps such as the obstacle avoidance. Because one of the things we run into is that because of the um, 
the blind spots of the sensors. These are all really reliable sensors, but also really cheap, so you can't expect them to be super yeah. accurate. So an option would be to add one of the servos, and similar to what the previous team did, just mount the sensor on top of the servo, so you could get a swipe of the actual area, and then get a very more accurate uh, positioning of the robot. So those are things we can keep on uh, working and adding, um, testing. How far along have you gone through going out there, pursuing for the sake of, now that you have this in place, going into considering having some ba somebody backing you up going forward with production and you know, preferably going for, for sale? How far along are you guys? Um, we haven't really looked for funding or anything like that as an option. Um, just basically we've reached out to the local high schools. Uh, we do have a lot of interest from teachers and you know some of the educators in these institutions. Um, so we know the the you know there's there's a demand for it, and I think we could market it and everything like that. Um, but we all we're all starting jobs now in January, so um, that's something I mean we can look forward to in the future. And it was actually on Dr. Tosinobu's idea to come up with this because he gets the demand um, from these local high schools to go out there and teach and everything like that. And, you know, they, they can't pay an engineer to come out there, so our curriculum makes it easier for local teachers to be able to teach this material. Um, but it's definitely something that we've talked to Dr. Tosanoli about, about continuing through FIU um, to kind of market this locally, at least. Be aware that that's a potential, uh, though we have those in the market, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you only have to make one change, something better, to go ahead and make applicable for a patent. So yeah. think about that for even though you're going to your respective companies and, and careers, think about it as an outreach program and for the sake of selling or making this marketable. Uh, you can actually pursue that with the help of the college and that goes very well on a resume. So think about that. Yeah. Actually, uh, um, I'll be here in the Miami area uh, in 